Hey, John here. So I've 3D printed this wheel and it has all these flat surfaces on it. It's got a gear inside here. And I'll put a stepper motor on here and a mesh with it to turn it around like this. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a score counter and each one of these surfaces is gonna have a digit. I'll put a bunch of them together and they can all count like an odometer. Now, how do I get the digits on there? Well, I thought about like printing them on there, maybe with another color or something. But when I printed it sideways like this and I would have to, uh, somehow either layer it in or add it to the surface. Uh, print, it, it, it's kind of complicated uh, and not, may, might, it might not even be possible with 3D printed. But on the other hand, if I print out a strip of paper like this and kind of, you know, I use rubber cement or something to glue it on there, I can have my digits just be printed on it however I want. I could change them, uh, print different colors, whatever I want. I laser printed this with a regular Hewlett Packard laser printer. And uh, I, to do that, I wrote a PostScript program to plot and locate all these digits. So how then does somebody write a PostScript program? You read the blue book and the green book. And if you're really adventuresome, you read the red book. These copies, this one I actually got in the garbage. It actually has a Fermilab sticker on it. So it must have come from somebody that retired from uh, Fermilab or something. Uh, and chucked it. I don't know. But anyway, I, these are these are the books that I read. I actually, the blue one is the main one I've read. Uh, you read this, you can pretty much do anything you need short of, well, I don't know, maybe embedded images or something. Uh, there's some advanced features that you need to go and uh, access the Red Book language reference if you're really going to get uh, serious about some uh, subtleties of the language. All right, so how do you get your own copy of the Blue Book and the Green Book and the Red Book, since they're all three, I think, are out of print? Actually, the Red Book is that was the first edition of their language reference. And if you Google for Adobe PostScript Blue Book and so on, you'll find that Adobe themselves is giving away the third edition, which I think is the, the recent one. I purchased this some decade ago or so. It cost me 50-some dollars. And I got the third edition on paperback with a CD that had this PDF in it as well. I don't feel bad about opening this up on a video because this is Adobe's own site. So they give this thing away for free. Uh, I do not recommend learning PostScript by just reading this particular reference manual. It's pretty reasonable, but you need to know a lot about PostScript before you just dive in to this particular book. So I'll leave that there as a reference. Once you get going, you can use this to look up all the commands and stuff. Our friends, oddly enough, <laughs> at Fermi, uh, you know, I go to a book recycling event in town a couple of years ago and I see, uh, you know, the red book and the, and the green book. That's where I got mine from. Uh, in this recycling event, the blue book I bought myself some years ago. Uh, oddly enough, Fermi, if you look at this URL, uh, yada, yada, offline postscript. If you go grab this, this is the, the blue book, which is what a lot of people use to learn how to write postscript the first time. If you come back to here and you just look at this directory, you'll find the blue book in here, the green book, and the all three, these are all red books. This is the red book I showed you earlier. This is edition two, third edition, and so on. A couple of, um, uh, post trip example programs and stuff like that as well. Uh, it's interesting that this is in a directory called offline, so that's odd. But if you Google Blue Book, this is the only place, there's only one other place I know to find it. And you look around, you'll probably see a couple of tutorials here and there. Uh, eventually you'll run into uh, a wikipedia site oh for crying out loud i watched some of these videos that's actually why i'm making this one these are very beginning videos and then they just kind of end uh if you really want to learn this you need a little bit more you can look around some of these other guys grab yourself a blue book blue book and where is it? here we go on wikipedia if you scroll to the bottom of this web page down in here you'll find links to right there that's the blue book and it's a zip file uh i think this is probably all the same stuff that's on fermi lab but if you go in here you grab the zip file open it up there will be a copy of the blue book pdf in here as well as all the source code of all the example programs that are in the book the same thing in the green book which is in here somewhere 
program design. This is the green book. Here we go. The green book. Uh, the original is in the Adobe Com website, which is not. I think if you click there, it wants you to log in or something. This one over here, Adobe used to give it away for free, and the Internet Archive has a copy of it when it was free. Again, another zip file with all the code snippets in there. If you get really into it and you want to create your own fonts, these are the uh, documentation for how the fonts work and stuff like that. Uh, there's just Everything you'd ever need to know about PostScript is all in those books. Everything else is just opinion, including my own videos. So if you read these things, this is the real deal. Now, the green book and the blue book are um, uh, version 1, PostScript level 1, the first version of the language. Today, we use level 3, which has uh, optimizations in it so that the thing will run a little bit faster. So given all those books and everything, that's all fine and dandy, but how do you actually write code? How do you actually debug your code? These books don't really get into that. So how do you get hit the ground running? Well, you can use tools like Events and GhostScript, which is what Events uses, I think, inside to render the PostScript itself. So let's write a little simple program, ex1.ps and show you how this is done. This is essentially a scripting language. It's customized, optimized for the way a printer would need to consume the code. And we'll get into that as we talk about why the language is the way that it is. So you start out with percent bang PS, which is like, like you know, in a shell script, you pound bang bin SH or bin bash or whatever. This is the magic beginning thing that tells the system what kind of file it is. It is not the file name. It is what's in the file that counts. Um, let's write a simple program that draws a little bitty line just to go through the, you know, the hello world. This is the blinky uh, if you're on an Arduino, right? So what are you going to do? You're going to say new path because what I'm going to do is I'm going to stroke a path. I'm going to lines, draw lines. And PostScript calls those strokes. And I'm going to go to a coordinate system. And PostScript, 0, 0 is the lower left corner. So X, like uh, X of uh, 72 is one inch to the right. All the printers are based on inches. Or more accurately, they're not based on inches per se. They're based on typesetters points. And there happens to be 72 points per inch. So if I say go 72 to the right and 72 up, and I say move there, that's how you would do this. I'll explain the order why these parameters are backwards in a minute. Uh, and then I would say, let's go to say 200, 200 from there to here. I want to draw a line there. Okay. Uh, then I want to say stroke to, to draw the line. And then you say show page. White space is, uh, you know, doesn't mean anything. You just have to have one space or more or a carriage return between all these commands. It could be all on one line like that, all on separate lines like this. This could be down here, that sort of thing. It's just like a C program. Uh, okay, so once you've got that, how do you look at it? Well, the most crude and simple way to do this is with a program called GhostScript. So these are both in the same directory. So I can just type in ex1.ps and hope and <laughs> cross my fingers that I did not make a mistake. And there we have the line. Now, if I printed this out on a piece of paper, this would be one inch over, one inch up. And I probably should have used a multiple of 72 to know how far that was going to be. But then I'm 200 and 200 up over there. So relatively speaking, that looks about right. So if this is 72 and, uh, and then that would make 100 be about right here. And then it would make 200 over here. So this is, you know, just the, the first quadrant of a coordinate system with zero, zero down here. Uh, if I printed this out on a printer, it would just boom, draw my line right there. The printers, of course, have margins and things like that. We'll have to deal with that as well uh, later on. But just to get the ground, just to get a toehold, how do you write these? How do you debug them? How do you look at them on your screen? Otherwise, you're going to waste a ton of paper. All right, so let's kill off Mr. GhostScript. If you use events instead of GhostScript, now this is a nice GUI. And what events does is it watches the file. All right. And by that, I mean, let's say we draw a line from 7272, which is down here. And then we go from there to 200, 200, up, which is here. And let's say from there, I'm going to go to uh, 
500, this is the x coordinate, and leave the y coordinate at 200. So now what I'm doing is I'm drawing a line from 72, 72 to 200, 200, and then from here I'm going to go to over here to 500, 200, right? So it should go up and over to the right. Now watch, if I save this file, Events is watching, the file updates, it re-renders the screen. So while I'm playing around over here, every time I save the file, this will re-render the page, all right? Once you're going and you don't make that many mistakes, uh, what we call programming mistakes, you can do this sort of thing, and it's kind of convenient. If you're making, you know, syntactic errors, let's say I left a parameter out of here. Now, this is an error. If I save this, now it'll say, oh, stack underflow. We'll talk about the stack in a minute. What this, obviously, this is how they say, they're what you're missing a parameter in here, all right? So if you're brand new to stack-oriented programming, this can be really, uh, you know, difficult to understand, which where did that happen in here? Now, I just deleted it, so I know exactly what went wrong. I can do it again, and you can see in the preview it came back. Uh, this is not really helpful. So this is a great way to render it and a great way to watch what's going on. But if you're making syntactic errors, right, if you do this in GhostScript, let's put the error back in again. Oops. There we go. Save this with a missing parameter, and I do this with GhostScript. Watch what GhostScript does. All right, now it says I can't I can't render this thing, and it says uh, I was doing a line to operation when I had a problem, and I underflowed. There's a missing thing. That's what underflow means. I got one thing, and I really want two, and the thing that I got is 500, and I was doing a line to operation. So this is much more helpful to try and figure out where this thing has gone awry than events is, because events is really designed to show you PostScript files that aren't broken. But if you're writing them, you're going to make mistakes. So when it gets to the point where you really need to know what's going on you want to use something like ghost script that gives you the ability to see all this cool stuff that's going on um now ghost script also comes with a thing called ghost view which is a lot like events but way more primitive if you run ghost view it's sort of like here's your events screen and this little guy over here pops up and shows you what we just saw on the screen down there so you can still see what's going on and this is like obviously written <laughs> like 30 years ago this is motif whenever you see this with these you know uh <laughs> I, I, would, I never liked motif i thought their widgets were really ugly this is an x application on windows this might look a whole lot nicer you can get ghost view and i think you can get events for uh, Windows, you can obviously run it with some other PostScript interpreter on Windows, um, but this is like this is like 25, 30 year old uh, application. Uh, GhostScript has been around a long time. So uh, anyway, so you got different tools. What you really want to be able to to do though is get a debugger that shows you what's going on as we tinker around with this language. This also, by the way, does have a mode where you can go in here and say, "Hey, watch the file." In case it changes so again just like events if i save this it'll eventually notice and draw it and you might say why use events well uh there are this actually is a perfectly reasonable way to do this but there are reasons why the uh why the uh, uh events is more useful like you can see this keeps on resizing itself i mean this is an incredibly old program as far as programs go but it is nice to see these errors so i want you to understand there's two nice viewing uh, uh packages this one uh ghost view integrates better with ghost script which is the back end that i'm sure both of these tools use Okay, so obviously our goal is not to make uh, so many mistakes. <laughs> so we will try to avoid that. But it's, it's a fact of life when you're learning how to code. So anyway, you're sort of seeing what's going on here. The PostScript is designed to draw things on pages. So a PostScript program, you would expect things like show page. Hey, I'm done drawing now. Spit out a page. After that, you could put more stuff down here. Let's say, give me a new path on another page. But this other one, maybe this page is going to be at 400, 100, and we're going to draw a single line and then draw that one and then show page. 
Now, it turns out if you don't put a show page on there, I think GhostScript will still render it because it knows that you wanted to do something that happens to end here. But if I send this to a printer and print it on a piece of paper, I think this last page would be missing if I did not tell it to show it, all right? So there are minor differences between the, the, uh, um, the two uh, systems there. So if I GV ex1.ps again, now I have a two-page document. Um, what we got going on here? Variable size, open print, all, save all. You can go to the next page by clicking this guy here. And there's my second one, right? This time I went to 400, 100, which is go over here, 400, go up here, 100. Then draw a line. Oh, I'll bet I drew it the other way. I went 400, 100, and then I went to 200, 200. So it would go up. Um, there's the little scroller here. Uh, would go up and to the left, all right? Uh, so to prove that, let's go ahead and draw another line from 200, 200 to 200, 250, right? So now it will go up because it's X comma Y, X and Y. Now this will not update because I didn't come back here and turn on the watch it for new stuff. There it goes. I'm on page one, all right? This thing is going to re-render itself. It started over on page one again. Here's page two. So I added this little vertical thing here. If we do the exact same thing with events, what happens with events is that, um, uh, what's going on here? He doesn't know that this is a two-page document. You know, what's up with that? Well, this is missing a document prefix that events wants to know. In more advanced versions of PostScript, you can put page numbers and how many pages there's going to be and things like that up here to let a, 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 a previewer or a renderer uh, know what to do. Now, events is not smart enough, I guess, to ask that or to figure it out on its own. Up here, it just says there's one of one pages. We'll talk more about that later uh, when we get into more advanced topics. So I guess the lesson learned, events is great for single page views unless you get more advanced and put in the page uh, numbering and, and control information at the top of your file, which is otherwise optional. All right, one last thing here. Sometimes you don't have the ability to you know, render uh, PostScript. If you want to give it to a friend or something, or you want to print it out, you can do PS to PDF, uh, at least on a Unix system, at ex1.ps, and it will create an ex1.pdf for you. So if you open up a PDF browser, now events will also do PDFs, uh, example1.pdf, you now have your two-page document, which otherwise events did not know how to render. So, you know, events, like I said, events wants to render things that are okay and perfectly pristine. It's not meant for <laughs> developing PostScript code per se. Uh, so anyway, if you wanted to post something on the web or something that you rendered in, in PostScript and you're dealing with people that don't know how to deal with raw PostScript files, just convert it to a PDF. If you don't have the ability to even run PS to PDF, uh, I don't know if Windows, I suspect there's a Windows version of this as well. You can go to the Adobe um, website itself and they have a thing called Distiller and it converts PostScript files into PDF files. So there's plenty of ways to do this. I'll leave that as a task for the reader, uh, <laughs> for the a task for the Windows user. If you're on a Mac or Unix system, you can easily just you know install PS to PDF, which probably comes uh, for free with GoScript anyway, because that's really what this is doing. It's using GoScript to render uh, not to the screen but into a PDF file. So all right, there's the Hello World program kind of thing, a la PostScript. On uh, next time, we'll talk more about how the language works and what stacks are and all that fun stuff. And maybe get into dictionaries and, and more, uh, more actual programming because it has loops and all kinds of other stuff that you can do in PostScript. Thanks for watching. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Bye.